Good afternoon and welcome to our online chat. Today we are going to talk about the, faith, the challenges that Europe is facing, the environment and climate challenges, what the European Environment Agency and Environment Information Observation Network, IONET, are doing to help Europe achieve its climate and uh, environment ambitions. I'm joined by um, European Environment Agency's Executive Director, Hans Brunings, and Laura Burke, who is the Chair of the EEA Management Board, as well as the Director General of the Irish Environmental Protection Agency. Welcome, Hans, and welcome, Laura. Happy to be here. Liza, to be here. Thank you. Um, today, um, we are actually streaming this event live um, to our social media followers, and we have a number of guests in our Zoom call as well. Um, the event will be recorded and shared later on our social media channels as well. But I would like to, before actually delving into the topic itself, I would like to invite our viewers to share their questions, uh, both in the Zoom chat as well as on our social media channels. And as we receive them, we will be actually forwarding them to uh, Hans and Laura uh, in a little while. So welcome again. Um, I think that we will talk a little bit about who we are because I'm not fully sure if everybody knows what the EEA is and what the EEA does and what INET is and what we do in terms of the European environment policy context. So what is the EEA? Hans. Well, uh, for 26 years now, the European Environment Agency as an organization that works with the countries of Europe, because we, we cover 38 countries in Europe as, and as our membership, uh, we have been bringing the best possible knowledge to European policymakers on environment and climate issues. And that at the level of the EU, the Commission, the European Parliament, Council, but also, of course, at the country level. And what makes us unique is that we base what we do on solid data, uh, the data which we are gathering with the member states. We make sure that this data is trustworthy through quality checking and quality assurance. But we do not only deliver data, we come with analysis, with assessments, as we call it. And, and you could say we connect the dots. For example, what, what is the link between a mobility pattern that is shifting air quality and human health issues? Those are the things that are important for policymakers when they want to make informed decisions. And on top of that, we do that for the broad variety of EU environment and climate policies, whether it's water policy or air quality or waste management, biodiversity, uh, circular economy, we work with networks in the member countries to deliver the best data. And of course, this is an incredibly opportune time to be doing it with the European Green Deal as the needle on the compass and uh, with a clear statement from the European Commission that it wants to be informed by the best potential knowledge. So that is in a nutshell what we do and the network approach that we have. Thank you. Laura, maybe you would like to add what INET is and what it means for a country uh, environment protection agency like the Irish EPA. Thank you. And I, I think to me, it, it comes down to 38 countries working together, sharing knowledge. Uh, Hans has talked about the, the, the data collection aspect, which is one, one aspect of it. But it really is that kind of peer group of support, knowledge sharing. And I'd have to say also benchmarking, because when you've got good, high quality, comparable data from each country, you can then say, this is how we're doing versus another country um, and versus Europe in general. And, and particularly for a small country like Ireland, and, and we certainly pride ourselves on being clean and green. Um, but when you're able to show, well, that actually other countries are doing better or doing differently, or they're taking different approaches to things, it really helps the environmental performance um, in our country. And I think from talking to colleagues in, in other countries, the same, the same happens. So it is a really unique group um, uh, of, of, of kind of people, uh, countries coming together. And I, I haven't seen any other types of examples of this, that everybody's coming together with the same aim is to have really good quality environmental data and to improve the environment overall based on that. 
And I think you've been the Director General of the Irish EPA since uh, 2011. Can you see any change in the, the, the type of knowledge and data and the work of IONET in this last decade? I, what I would really have seen over the last number of years, and certainly when I came into the agency, um, we were very focused on data collection, and nearly the data collection was the aim in its own right. And what we've changed now completely is the data collection to what end? How is that going to improve the situation? How are we going to make that data translated into knowledge, but also make it much more relevant to whether it's a policymaker or a citizen or whomever that might be? And I think that's probably been a, on a journey that countries such as Ireland have worked our, our way through with the European Environment Agency. And then, of course, the ease of collecting data, the way we collect data is completely different now than it would have been 10 years ago. And, and we're doing things now that were completely unheard of. Um, so I think it has been a, it's been a really exciting journey and I'd hope it continue to be that. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit later about what the next decade might actually bring, because I think some of the things that Hans has uh, highlighted is the work of the EEA and IONET, uh, point at the big, big changes, the sustainability ch change, uh, challenges that we have uh, that were also highlighted in our latest uh, State of Environment and Outlook report, SOER 2020. What are the challenges that you foresee for the next decade and how do they affect European citizens' lives? Well, Hans, I, I would say start. that uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, this decade is sometimes framed as the pivotal decade. Huh? We need to turn around uh, the challenges that we see uh, in climate change. We, we need to really decouple economic performance from greenhouse gas emissions. And, and Europe has been doing that, but globally we need to bend the trend. So stronger ambitions there, which Europe is framing with minus 55% uh, cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. But it's not only on, on climate. Climate shouldn't crowd out the rest of the environmental agenda. We also see it on biodiversity. And this is a big year on biodiversity. The world will meet in Kunming for the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. And some people say we need a Paris moment for biodiversity because the natural capital, the ecosystems and the services which they deliver to society are under continued threat. So that we need to address as well. And then a third, maybe even less uh, clear challenge, but it's fundamental, is the way in which we use resources. And that links to uh, resource efficiency and the circular economy. We know that one of the main drivers of uh, impacts on environment and on climate is actually our resource use. So if we can address these three things and we understand that they are linked in the next decade, that's when we will be really addressing the core issues. And we know where the linkages are. They are in our systems of production and consumption. So if we can connect in transforming the energy system, if we can connect them in transforming our mobility system, our food system, which is really difficult, but we really need to address it. Yeah? And then the built environment or urban environment, then we will really be going from the drivers of impacts on environment and climate to the solutions. And that is also where I think in the last 10 years, analytically, we have made a big jump forward in the EEA and together with the network uh, and also with the scientific community, but where we now need to make that connection to the policy making uh, environment. And, and I think there are great opportunities in the, in the European Green Deal to bring that type of knowledge to the European level. Thank you. Uh, maybe something that I've, uh, we could explore a little bit more in terms of challenges for the decade ahead is implementation. So Europe has a set of uh, very, very detailed policies when it comes to water quality, air quality, uh, but implementation is often mentioned as one of the things that we need to work further on. So from the country perspective, what kind of challenges, uh, Laura, do you see? in terms of implementing existing law, but also more ambitious targets that the European policy outlines? Well, I think one of the things, and I, I have said it many times at a national level, is we need to translate aspiration into implementation. 
Um, there can be a lot of talk about, uh, you know, whether it's climate or water or biodiversity, but actually then delivering. Um, and each of us as countries sign up to European directives. We commit to them, but then to translate the commitment to actually resources on the ground uh, to deliver can be the challenge. And it's nearly like we distance ourselves and say, oh, bad, Europe has imposed something on us. They haven't imposed anything on it. It's, it's commitments we've signed up to in order to protect the environment and human health. Um, and that's a message I suppose we certainly have been promoting and really pushing um, over the last number of, of years because it's, it's a very dangerous narrative to be blaming you know, a, an institution outside your own country uh, for your lack of, uh, of implementation. And, the, you know, why, why don't we implement, implement as well as we should some of its prioritization? Um, and there is a risk, and certainly has been a risk over the years that countries, um, and I said, I, I, I'm talking about my own country as much as anything else, always looked at the economic issue first and says, okay, we'll sort out the econ economy. And when the economy is sorted out, then we'll worry about the social and then we'll worry about the environment. And I think the change in the narrative now is realizing that the social, the economic and the environment are all interlinked. You cannot distance one from the other. And it, it, it really does take uh, prioritization and will at a political level, but it will only, the, the will of political level will only be there if there's the will at the citizens level. So I do think it's been a tipping point over the last number of years of people really realizing the importance of the environment and that the environment does require that investment because it's a benefit for us all if you make that investment. And I suppose the last piece on that, and it, you know, I suppose linking it to this year and the COVID, COVID, I think what we're seeing is people really realizing the importance of their local environment. You know, As we are restricted to small areas, we are really seeing uh, the importance of having a good, clean quality of environment locally to us. And I would hope as we come out of COVID that people then realise that, well, that means it does take resources, it does take money, it does take commitment to deliver on the ambitions that we say. It is still quite impressive that despite the economic shocks of COVID, uh, the European Green Deal seems to still uh, pursue the same uh, goals, yeah. even more so ambitiously. What are the latest developments on the European policy uh, side? Because well, the biodiversity strategy was adopted and there are many more to come. Yeah, I, I think you if you go through the main objectives at the European level, um, I, they, they, there is a really clear sense of direction and they go uh, with you know becoming the first uh, climate neutral continent where for 2030 there is a clear objective now of minus 55 that is on the table and that is discussed in its implications the, but there is also the mid-century climate neutrality and uh, net zero, zero emissions so that that is really important to have as a long-term objective then we have a biodiversity strategy which really sets a different set of targets. Until now, it was mainly protecting enough square kilometers and, and halting biodiversity loss. That was the overarching goal. Now we actually have a positive goal. Yeah, We talk about restoration of ecosystems because they deliver to society the types of uh, natural capital benefits, the ecosystem services that we rely on. I also think that uh, the circular economy is now landing in sectors, in economic sectors. There is an initiative, for example, on the textiles industry, which, which is something that is close and close <laughs> to everybody, if we could say so. Um, the zero pollution, which, I mean, if you think of it, that is a really, really, really high ambition. Zero pollution, yeah, which is linked then to also innovation in industry and it's linked to the chemical strategy so all of these things go to the fundamental uh, components of how we consume how we produce and how we can make this more sustainable but what i think makes that european green deal even stronger is that there is an explicit link with the social dimension you know the just just transition dimension and there is a link with the economic fundamentals because investments are driving innovation and are driving econom the economy. And uh, the sustainable investment uh, directive or, or a direction that is in it rather is also very important. So it's a package 
that has a 2030 perspective with mid-century as a sort of you know longer perspective it hangs together and and it is of a type of ambition where we as an agency said okay these are the ambitions we need to flank this with an equally ambitious strategy because this type of most ambitious european policy setting now requires the most ambitious knowledge uh, agenda to support it and that's where where the origins of our strategy come from we'll talk a little bit more about the strategy we'll talk a lot more about our strategy but before we get to that point i know that constant has got some questions so i'll ask him to turn on uh, his camera and microphone and for those viewers that have joined us a bit later uh, you can share your questions in our social media channels but also in the zoom call and constant will actually bring them forward to our uh, guests constant yeah, Please. thanks, uh, Goldson. Uh, the first question is from Lucas Pokorny uh, on Facebook, who's watching it on Facebook. Uh, how big a role will Earth observation play in IONET activities in the future? Could you give some concrete examples? Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, yeah. Let, me, let me just uh, also Good. put in the second question, then I'll... Uh, the second question from Tom uh, van der Beken. Uh, do the EEA and EPA I'm assuming he's referring to the Irish EPA, work together with artists, filmmakers to bring scientific knowledge to a broader audience? The first two questions. Okay, so well, maybe... Earth observation, I, I can take that one. I leave the artsy questions for Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it, that is a great question, okay. The, the uh, EEA is one of the core partners in the Copernicus investments in Europe. Yeah? And we are, of course, mostly on the user side. We want to make use of Earth observation and bring it to the policymakers. So what we see over the years is an increased uptake of uh, Earth observation Copernicus data in our reports, in our data flows. And it is part of a broader innovation that we are pushing on data intelligence, combining a variety of data to make things more up to date, yeah? to have better coverage, to have more granularity in data, to be able to cut out, I would say, delineations of data, and also to make combinations of data sources. Because if you want to go to production and consumption systems, you need to be able to connect this to socioeconomic data yeah? and uh, improved data and improved uh, geospatial precision in data allows us to do that. And the ambition in the next Copernicus program is together with our partners, and that's uh, ECMWF, uh, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in Reading, and uh, Mercator Ocean, who do, do the, the marine component, that we would work together strongly to make the best out of the Copernicus data and put it at the service of policymakers and the broader public, which we're already doing in a couple of our products, like the air quality index, which is also based on Copernicus observations. So yeah, that is a big ambition uh, for the agency, and we will continue to work in that direction. And so, Laura, but before I go into the, the, the artsy <laughs> question, just <laughs> on the, I suppose, the, the Copernicus, uh, one of the as a kind of a member state, what we've been really pushing is to try and have real life tangible actions that we can kind of translate the Copernicus into things on the ground for us. And we've used the Copernicus atmospheric monitoring uh, services data to confirm what's feasible around air quality data. And um, we are now creating preliminary uh, air quality forecasts using the Copernicus data. And that's really exciting for us. It's really new. So it's it's an addition, it's not instead of. And I think there's going to be lots of examples there of things that we can do. Illegal waste dumping is another area that it, it can assist us in as well. On, the, on the, the using the arts and filmmakers, this is something we're relatively new on, I'd have to say. Um, but we've, we've uh, 420 staff in, in the Irish EPA, and we are pretty much all scientists. And sometimes scientists aren't the best at communicating science or you know wrong side of brain or, or whatever it might be so more recently we certainly have been working with filmmakers we've been showing them some of our, our research in particular and then 
those those programs then are they're translating that research into things that are understandable, interesting, relevant for people, um, and also our I suppose our most out there one uh, um, has been in the context of conferences to use a visual artist to then pull together the messages at the end of a conference, which has been as I said really really interesting. So we are um, and we've also now uh, incorporated in, in our staff, and I think we're probably behind the EEA in, in this regard, having behavioural scientists on board as well in the staff. So trying to have much more cross-disciplinarity and really using people who have the expertise to translate knowledge and data into good visuals um, and good, you know, good messages for others, non-scientists, um, has been important for us. Yeah. If, if I may uh, add to that. Please. Um, I certainly consider photography as one of the art forms out there. Uh, we have a photo competition uh, that, uh, that delivers fantastic material that we continuously embed in our reports, on our website, in, in, in everything we publish and put online. Uh, and I mean, the quality of that over the years has increased and is just astonishing. So any, any of the great pictures you will see in our reports come from actual citizens who have delivered these pictures to us. Uh, that is one element. We, we also have done some uh, smaller films, uh, in informational films and movies and uh, in the past to, to explain complex issues, which uh, in and of itself is also an art form if you want to do that very well. We sometimes contribute to documentaries. Um, I'm doing uh, some input into a climate change documentary uh, for the moment. Uh, and we have actually for the first time recruited a number of years ago, people whose specialty is indeed the visualization of uh, data and maps and graphs uh, because we, we wanted to improve the visual quality of complex information on the environment and climate to make it more accessible uh, to, to others. Uh, so that, that I can add to Laura's uh, answer as well. Uh, and maybe just to, to add, Gildan, I think this is all about making information relevant to people and interesting to people. And you know, sometimes I, I think as scientists, we think the science should speak in itself. And of course, it does to a certain extent, but you need to look at your audience and say, how do we make this relevant to them? And the visualization is an absolutely key aspect of it. You know, showing complex graphs, you know, it, it, it's <laughs> going to be interesting to some people, but you're not going to win hearts and minds. And so therefore that visualization and, and kind of that you know, again, it's using new technology, it's using different technology to translate this data and to make it much more usable for people. Yeah, that's why actually the secret of the successful photo competitions is a strong link between every one of us and with nature and so on. That's the connection point. Um, I'll go back to discussing about the strategy. So digitalization, yes, better communication with citizens and more engagement and so on. These are all part of the strategy, but maybe we just step, uh, we take two steps back. In December, the EA Management Board adopted a new strategy, as you might see in the background, uh, for the next decade. Um, what is different about this strategy? We need new knowledge, yes, but what is different? Well, what, what makes it different uh, for me is that for the first time, we take a 10-year perspective, yeah? And I think that is important because Europe is clearly stating ambitions towards 2030. And so taking a 10-year perspective, I think, uh, was, was necessary. Yeah? The second uh, thing is that we, we formulated this strategy, I think, based on the principles of innovation. You know, how, how can we innovate in something that doesn't need to innovate because it's not good today? but because we need to innovate to stay at the forefront of what our core mandate is, and that is deliver the best data and analysis in support of policies. And we also uh, focus on integration, because increasingly we are not discussing water in a, a, you know, a highly segmented way, distinct from air, distinct from nature, distinct from climate, it's integration. And so if you want to do that, 
you need to invest. Yeah, and that's that's the third meaning of I. Uh, I would in, in innovation, integration, and that requires investment. Investments in your network, investments in your own capacities, investments in how you use modern technology to uh, to deliver that type of analysis. Uh, so th that ambition is there, and I thought it was the only way to stay at the forefront of what we do was to be equally ambitious as the policies that we see now in the European Green Deal. So that, that's what was driving uh, the whole uh, discussion on the strategy. Perhaps I could uh, follow it up with Laura, uh, because it is a joint strategy. It's with EEA and IONET. What does that mean for IONET? And, and that's exactly where I, where I wanted to come in, Gilton, because I think IONET has been so important and it's such a unique network um, and the EEA INET kind of combination is so unique and so powerful that it really in the context of innovation this is we need to innovate in the INET as well we can't sit and wait for the EEA to, to innovate and, and then the INET stays as is um, it really needs to build on the, the excellent work that has been done to date but I will be looking at things like you know, a broader network, more data sources, who else can support us uh, so that the, the uh, work that's done, the assessments are done, do take in some of the things like the socioeconomic data that uh, will be really helpful in, in our assessments. So I think for INET, it's a really exciting time as well. It's a really interesting time to say, okay, well, where to from here? You know, we, of course, data collection is, is, is always and will always be part of INET, but it's so much more. And to me, part of that is around much more timely information. You know, we, we, people want that data much faster. We need to be able to respond to policy, uh, res policy queries, policy issues, uh, whether at European level or at national level, much, much faster. Um, and as I said, I think that's going to be the challenge, but also the opportunity for INET over the next couple of years. Yeah, I I, Gilchin, I, there is maybe yes. one component that we don't often talk about in public, but if, if we are the what some call a boundary organization that bridges science and knowledge to policymakers, we also in the strategy have a very deliberate approach and investment towards the scientific side, because there is no other player in the world that is investing so much into science uh, on sustainability, climate, environment than the European Union. Uh, the, the Horizon Europe program and a number of other programs, the, the Joint Research Center, which is a very large research facility at the service of Europe. So I think we also need to play a role to work in collaboration with, that, with those strong scientific networks to make sure that uh, our data, our, our methodologies, our analysis is informed also by the very rapid advances that take place when it comes to understanding ecosystems, climate dynamics, uh, you know, resource challenges. Those are the things that, that I think really matter. You have been highlighting the systemic nature of the challenges and the changing nature of the knowledge that we will need. And, um, some of the keywords that also uh, stand out in the strategy and the discussions that led to it were was actionable and trusted knowledge. What does actionable and trusted knowledge mean for the decade to come? For Laura, what do you need uh, from the country perspective as actionable knowledge? And it, it, to me, that always comes back to relevance. You know, it's linking it back to the policies, linking it back. Um, to the questions that are being, you know, really closely linked, for example, in this instance, we're going to be talking about the, you know, it's the Green Deal. So it has to be tied in directly and back to timely as well, because we need that knowledge. We need to be able to do ex ante assessments as well as ex post assessments. Um, and that piece around being trusted, and this is the huge value of the EEA um, uh, data, it is that trusted it is you know it's independent data it's scientifically robust it we, we nobody questions it it is accurate data so what we now need to to do is to make sure in the context of all of the challenges around the green deal and all of the things that we want to do 
that the information and assessments that are being provided support the Green Deal in a timely way. And that's what, to me, what's actionable is, is that it is you're delivering what's needed for the policymakers and the citizen. Hans, maybe you'd like to come in. How do people trust our, why should they trust our knowledge? Well, one, one of the, the key elements from the start was uh, that we are fully transparent. And, and what we write is traceable, you know. So if we write a report and we put a table in it, you can go to the basic data. So it is transparent where it is coming from. It's traceable. Uh, actually, what, what not too many people know, but a large part of what is downloaded through our website is basic data sets where scientists or people can go and look for themselves at the data. So that I think is, is uh, essential. The second thing is that we work with official data uh, for the yeah. most part. So the, the country's legitimacy of public institutions is behind it. And then we do quality checking and quality control, uh, which of course is important be, because also even on knowledge, you need a level playing field and eh, going into decision making. So I, I think that is important. And thirdly, when we work with other data, and that is increasingly the case, yeah, uh, because we, we have a lot more data than the official monitoring stations in the countries. Think of Copernicus, but also think increasingly of uh, citizen science data that can come in or data from companies. Before we use it, we do a serious assessment of this data. Uh, we don't just integrate anything in uh, that, that comes our way into our report. So that is there. And then we are also accountable to the European Parliament and to the European institutions. So anybody who has questions about our data, we cannot just uh, shrug this off. We will be held accountable. We need to go out there and defend if there would be issues. So I would say there is a sort of mechanism that guarantees that what we do is done in a serious, serious way and that is up for scrutiny. I mean, okay, so, uh, it, it, Laura, is the core, it is the core of, of what the EEA does and it's the core of what, what, what environment agencies do. It is, it is in our, our, our very being, it has to be, you know, solid, like it's all about the evidence, it's all about the science, it's all about the data. And as Hans says, therefore it has to be transparent but that's what we stand over on every day of the week. Um, so that's key to, to, I think, to all of our organizations. Very good. Uh, Constant has some questions for you from the public. Yeah, there's more questions. Uh, thanks, Gautam. There's more questions online. Um, first one is from uh, Irina. In a context where the nationwide environmental data collection is insufficient and many types of data are not collected at all, for instance, you mentioned ecosystem services, biodiversity, some air pollutants. Can civil society data collection systems be a temporary solution? And how can they gain more credibility? Can these data be used for policymaking? And what are potential pitfalls other than technical quality? And I have a second question, a question from Todd uh, relating to the strategy. What is your top environmental priority for the next 10 years in Europe? And what about uh, in Ireland? Thank you. Laura, do you have experience with citizen science and other science sources as well? So if, if you go first, yeah. I can compliment maybe. Absolutely. Um, and we do quite, we, we've actually targeted citizen science over the last number of years here. I'd have to say complementary to official data rather than instead of official data. So we have a national biodiversity data center in Ireland collecting um, a wide range of uh, citizen science data for you know from all over the country um, and it's everything from uh, different types of, of, of birds water quality you name it and we we as an EPA uh, fund and do projects with the biodiversity data center but we also work with um, Ontashka which would be the national trust in Ireland and, um, and link that in with the GLOBE program, which is a, a, a actually it's a US program uh, involving NASA around air quality and school children and uh, getting that type of citizen science data. Um, and that's comparable. The advantage of, of using the GLOBE is that it is all across the world. And we've got 
kids in, in Ireland comparing air quality data to that in Africa, to that in Israel. Um, so not only are you getting good data um, and, good, and teaching children about good scientific methods to collect data, but also then you're getting that, that comparability. Um, and we've just launched very recently a project or a, another project on air quality in Ireland, um, which is actually similar to one that, that happened in, in Flanders in Belgium, the Curious Nose uh, program that, that a number of people would be aware of. And we're involving citizens, uh, thousands of citizens in collecting air quality data. Um, the key for me though is around, it doesn't mean that the state can't invest in the data, the data collection that it should be doing. This is, should be above and beyond. And there's two advantages of citizen science for me. First of all, it is of course getting more information, more data in because you can always have the more data. But that data then has to be fed back to citizens. We need to be engaging with them and telling, you know, telling them the results of it. But also nearly more importantly, having people involved in citizen science means they get more interested in the environment because they're active, they're active participants in it. And we're seeing that again and again, whether it's children or whether it's members of the public that engage in the citizen science, they report back to us that they are much more environmentally aware at the, you know, a, as they do those, those programs. Um, I don't know if you want, maybe if I, if I just do the, the top environmental priority in Ireland and then I'll hand back to, to Hans. And in a way, this is a bit of a cheat because I'm, I'm always reluctant to say it's climate or it's biodiversity or it's water quality, but the EPA in Ireland just produced our State of the Environment report in December. And the overarching message in that report says that we need a national environmental policy position in Ireland, which actually clearly articulates Ireland's ambition for environmental quality overall, and with, then, with actionable steps as part of that. And the reason, you know, I say, because we actually need to say, well, what's the overall level of ambition? And the risk is that you've got a climate plan or a climate policy, you have a water policy, you have an air quality policy. And what you forget or people forget is they are all interconnected, they are all interlinked. And actually what you need is, what is our overarching ambition? And what we would be saying to, to our, particularly to our government and to people in Ireland is, if Ireland is saying we're clean and green, if we are, you know, whether it's our tourism industry or agriculture industry, that is what, again, is, is key for us. Well, then what are we absolutely clearly stating is the level of ambition? Is it to meet EU standards? Is it to go above EU standards? Where do we want to be? And for me, that's what I'll be pushing over the next number of years in Ireland. Yeah, I'll tag on first with the second question with what Laura was saying, and I'll, I'll, I'll say the same thing, but maybe uh, in different words. Uh, I think the top priority is that people understand that there is urgency there. Uh, I mean, there is no time to waste, and that is translated in speeding up and scaling up solutions that we know are there. Uh, and that requires uh, policy investments that requires citizen involvement societal transitions so that is uh, and it all boils down i think to taking natural capital as the foundational capital for any healthy society we live in a context where i think it's fair to say that we overvalue financial capital we undervalue social capital and we hardly value natural capital at all yeah and, and that is clearly unsustainable. So my top priority would be to understand the urgency to accept natural capital in whatever context you want to frame it, climate, biodiversity, ecosystems, water quality, natural capital as a catch-all term, and to, to understand that it is truly foundational for any healthy society that wants to have a long-term prospect. And that, that would be uh, my top priority. Uh, then the, the first question, to echo uh, what Laura has been saying, the European Environment Agency was a foundational partner of the European Citizen Science Association, so we have been from the start, I think, working with that. There is already a big body of knowledge where we rely on citizens, eh? the nature directives, uh, it, the bird uh, and habitats directive, without ornithologists that are mostly citizen scientists, we wouldn't know uh, much about any of that. Uh, in, but it goes beyond that. In Finland, there are a couple of lakes, I've been told, 
and uh, the Finnish Environmental Protection Agency, the Environment Institute, as they call it, uh, has been working recently with, with uh, schools and citizen scientists to measure the quality in Finnish lakes yeah, with very good uh, results. Uh, Laura mentioned curious noses uh, that works with citizens and that has led to improved modeling of air quality in Belgium. So it's in addition, but it can also improve what we already know. And then a next step, which we are starting to see is that uh, it's indeed more distributed, it's low cost, but it hardly involves uh, people. It's the internet of things. Yeah. Yeah? Th there are now increasingly devices that are being developed that we can distribute over a territory and they automatically send all sorts of information which we don't get from our uh, normal uh, stations. I heard an undertone I thought in the question as well, which was what if countries are not necessarily monitoring what should be monitored? Can citizens then step in? Well, we, we, we have seen that as well. In a couple of instances in some member states, there was hesitance to uh, on air quality primarily, if I can say so, or on waste uh, streams where you have an illegal uh, system as well in some countries. Uh, we, we have stepped in as an agency and has have used for example copernicus data and artificial intelligence to come in with data that was then used locally by citizens by organizations to put some pressure on on the government to then step it up and uh, and monitor and and be more transparent so there is indeed a whole uh, a whole system also of alternatives to what what is the the sensu stricto uh, official network of monitoring thank you i think with the latest technologies like mobile phones and different apps there are uh, many more opportunities yeah, yeah. Uh, looking at marine litter for example it's one of the work areas that we try yeah. to um, uh, help the european policies so based on that note maybe um We'll explore one of the other points that the strategy actually identifies, it's digitalization. The last 10 years, have, we've seen an unbelievable uh, digital uh, revolution, if we can call it. And in the last year, like now we are meeting through an online platform and we are all in different locations and we are streaming live to a setting. So things are changing in the digital world and we presume that they will continue uh, this kind of rapid change, how will uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence, the full potential of uh, these technologies impact uh, EEA's and INET's work? Maybe well, we start with Johans. I, I think there are at least two components. Uh, one component is the technology proper. Uh, you, need, you need to be able to deal with massive amounts of data. And so we have invested in that capacity uh, and we are part of networks, for example, that, that uh, deal with the unbelievable amount of Copernicus data, which we don't do, it, it's in a network. Uh, so that is a technology. Uh, if you would uh, look at the data 20 years ago that was absorbed and, and transferred to the agency and the data now, it, I, it's orders of magnitude more today, yeah? But then you could say, so what? If you don't have the capacity to then do something with that data, and that's what you could call data intelligence. And part of that uh, is methodology. Part of that uh, is indeed uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, part of that is data intelligence approaches that you use. And in the end, it all also boils down to our own capacity, our own intelligence to deal with that massive amount of data. So. I always say of artificial intelligence will help us uh, and will do a lot, but we've got a lot of space above our head to use our own intelligence better. And that is where we try to be at the forefront of well, technology and using the data for to create better knowledge. Those are the two uh, key components that we are aiming for. Laura, would you like to? Yeah, I, I think good and just, on that, it, and, and maybe it's a, it's a mantra of mine, is that, that the IT is there to support our work 
it, sometimes I think people think the IT systems or the, the new technology is kind of, it, it is the outcome. It's only there to support, to help us deliver better. And what also strikes me is by using, you know, digitalization, et cetera, it can mean that our, our own people, our own staff can do much more added value, much more interesting work. And that's where I can see it can help us. And I'm, but I'm always conscious that it is a tool in order to deliver. And that's we, we always need to remember that. But one area that, that we've been doing in Ireland is, is using machine learning and automated image classification to, 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 to uh, develop land, land cover maps, which are incredibly important, will be even more important now in, in the context of the Green Deal. So it is, there's huge opportunity here. I do think we have to be very targeted and focused with it because I think you can drown in all the data and not quite and, and be doing things and you're not quite sure why. So it is targeting the key things that it can support us in what we want to achieve. If if I can go back yes, to one please. of the previous the previous questions on biodiversity, yeah, uh, we are currently uh, running a sort of uh, test a pilot project internally where we will use artificial intelligence, Copernicus data. Uh, and to, to advance knowledge on biodiversity. Yeah? So we, we are experimenting with this and we are reaching out also in the network to look for the partners that have done that type of tests and experiments or are using it. Because as, as a European Environment Agency, if you say we're a network organization, it doesn't go in one direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we can learn a lot from what is happening in the countries. And when I say we, it's the network, which yeah. is why the capacity building, the joint sharing of that type of new technologies and capacities is one of the key goals of the network, also in the strategy, becoming a real knowledge network in the next 10 years, rather than a data transfer network. You know? And good. It is one of the strategic objectives, as you mentioned. Sorry, please go ahead. So you've, 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 you've got, got us going or got me going. And the other thing is, you know, some of it can be very sophisticated technology, but even, for example, things like drones. And, and Hans was, was, was talking about doing, using citizen science for uh, water quality monitoring in Finland. What we've started doing is using drones to just pick up water samples in lakes in Ireland that normally would require a boat and you know all sorts of difficulties. And it means it's simpler, it's faster, you can take more samples, you can build in other testing as you go along. So it's kind of simple. And, and, and the other one is, is we've been using new radon measurements so you used to have to you know you get a radon test you'd leave it in your home for three months and then you get the the answer and what we were finding is that people weren't really engaging even if they got a high result they weren't doing anything with regard to remediation of their homes um but what we there's new technology there that you can you can borrow a radon monitor we, we've given them to, to a local library, you borrow it and you see your radon measurement in your home and you can see the level. And from a behavioral change point of view, people are much more inclined now to remediate because they, they physically yeah. sit in front of them. And so it's not really, really sophisticated technology, but it is using technology to deliver change. It makes measurements simpler. Um, we have two more questions, but I can see that the questions are kind of related to one of the points. Before I give the floor to Constant, uh, one of the challenges uh, that are that is highlighted in the strategy itself is that you cannot, uh, you know, things are connected. You know, it's systems. It's uh, you can't just talk about land without looking at the biodiversity aspect, without looking at. Uh, land use, urbanization, and so on. So there is a tendency of looking, connecting the dots. Having said that, I'll give the floor to Constance, so maybe in your responses, you could also look at the work areas and how they're linked together. Constance, please. Thanks, Milton. Um, first question uh, from Ensliff Kennedy. Uh, will wetlands be given a priority in climate action to preserve biodiversity and for ecosystem services? I'm always very concerned about the pressures of forestry, drainage, and extraction on peatlands in Ireland. And another question from David Richard, how important is the place of agriculture in the strategy and what are the main priorities regarding this domain, especially in France, Germany, and the Benelux? 
Laura, why don't you take the peat question first? Hans is always interested in the peat question in Ireland, having, I think you traveled through the Midlands of Ireland and yes. did all of, all of our peat. And peat is a big issue in Ireland. And, and, and if you allow me a minute, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural issue that, that many years ago when the Irish state was really being formed and we wanted energy security, the, there was a strategic decision at the time to dig peat and to, and to use peat in energy production primarily. Now, a decision at that time without realizing the environmental impact was, was an appropriate decision for the state, but that isn't the decision that should still be there anymore. And certainly over the last number of years, we have been highlighting the impact of peat. And you're back to interlinkages. It's you know, you're, you're digging up a peat, which is causing damage um, to, to uh, so causing damage to biodiversity, but it's also have uh, impact on climate. You then burn a, a, a poor fuel um, and you're causing greenhouse gas emissions. So there's, there's multiple issues with regard to peat. But as I said, I just want to kind of that, that cultural piece don't un underestimate. People are used to having peat in power stations, but also, I suppose, more importantly, peat burning in their in their homes. What we're now seeing in Ireland, and, and I think we really have reached a tipping point in Ireland, is there's no longer burn, and we as an EPA have been calling for this for a number of years, there is no longer burning of peat in power stations in Ireland. That has stopped this year. Do not underestimate that as a significant achievement in the context of protecting our environment. Um, in addition to that, there is now significant investment in re-wetting, rehabilitating peatlands. Um, I'm really enthused about it. I think it's one of the most positive moves from an environment perspective. There are so many win-wins. There's win-wins cli for climate, win-wins for biodiversity. Um, and it has, as I said, that is that tipping point. The, there is an issue around just transition and Hans had raised it at the beginning because when we're talking about the environment and we're talking about changes, there are people who are many thousands of people who are employed in a particular industry. So what is the transition for them? How do we make sure that there's good quality jobs for those people, different jobs? So we are in the midst of that transition in Ireland. I wouldn't say we're there yet. There's definitely still challenges in the peak question, but I think we have come to a realization that, th that there is a change and that there's benefits in that change. Um, so it is a it's a it's a good news story, and I would hope in five years time to be able to come back and be able to talk about, for example, ecotourism, bog tourism, people coming from all around the world to look at the types of biodiversity that you have in Irish bogs and actually using it as a unique environment that is protected for the good, not only of people in Ireland, but for people around Europe. Over to you, okay, if I if I can uh, add to that, uh, it, it's clear that wetlands are some of the most uh, threatened ecosystems. Uh, they do play a role in the biodiversity strategy. That is clear. They also play a role in climate adaptation uh, discussions in Europe. Uh, they are part of restoration efforts. And if we protect, if we go from 20 to 30 percent protected areas, in Europe, uh, it's clear that wetlands have to be included as an essential uh, ecosystem in that, uh, that uh, effort to protect more. Uh, so I, I will leave it at that for that question. The question on agriculture is, uh, is of course, a critical one. Uh, and I think there are, are two segments to the answer. First of all, we like to talk about the food system because agriculture is only one part in the food system. Before that, you have the agrochemical input industries, you could say. After the agricultural production or the fisheries, you have uh, those companies who buy that produce and transform it into food. Then you have the big retailers. You, I mean, you've got consumer choices, you've got waste. So there is a whole, a whole system behind it. I think that we've not served uh, the whole cause well by emphasizing only one slice in it, agriculture. That has stigmatized farmers uh, whom we often need to support because they don't make a decent living. They are squeezed by the other players in the system. And I think what we need to do is to come to a more sustainable food system. 
and that has European dimensions. It has global dimensions. We know that the European food system depends on external externalization of costs as well. And so we need to get to the bottom of this. Um, that also means serious discussions about dietary choices that we make. Yeah? That may, means serious choices about the use of chemicals. That means ch serious choices about water use, about the link with the energy system. And all of that is part now much more explicitly of the European debate. Whether you are speaking uh, at a European event about biodiversity or climate or uh, energy, or agriculture proper, you always land with the food system. Yeah. There is no more way around it. And I think addressing this in an open, facts-based, analytical way that, that focuses on a fair way forward for those people who are producing our food, rather than stigmatizing them, yeah. I think is really essential. Uh, and, you know, you could simplistically put it in the following way. It, at this moment, we pay four times for our food. Eh? We pay when we buy it. We pay through our taxes when we have to subsidize the people who grow our food, farmers. And how that system works is not exactly always targeting the poorest farmers. Yeah. Then we pay again uh, as a public when we have to deal with the climate and environment consequences. And we pay when we go to the doctor because... Our, we have a very safe food system in Europe, but our food habits are not necessarily the healthiest. Now, in the 21st century, there must be a better way to deal with food than that. And that is where the real challenge is. So does it play a big role? Yes, we are in the agency focusing on the food system, and it will be one of the four systems that we will uh, report around and bring our knowledge together around. Well, I think one more question from the public but please Laura sorry go ahead sorry, sorry just and as like I think the work of the EEA in this area is incredibly important because it is so fundamental to all of the changes we're making and, you know again as an agricultural country uh 30 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture it is absolutely in the top of our minds and what Hans was talking there about stigmatizing people it is of no benefit to pit one group against another that will not actually bring us forward whether we're talking about agriculture or other environmental issues and just two quick things on that first of all is how we pay and how we subsidize our farmers we really have to look at and it, it should be results-based payments uh, payment for ecosystem services payment for carbon farming payment for delivery and that will be positive payments um, for the farmers as well. And then the last piece is just around food waste because we're also paying, we all go into the shops, we buy lots of stuff, we don't use it and we spend around 700 euros a year wasting food. Um, it's, it, it really, it, it is something that we can all do every day. There is a much broader piece with Chance is talking about the, the, the food system, but just at an individual level, it is action yeah. that can, people can take. Okay, I, Gulchin, I need 30 additional yes, seconds yes, on this because Laura says indeed that uh, results-based subsidizing of farmers for, for biodiversity protection, yes, but that should come on top of a fair price yes, for their product. Absolutely. That yeah. should be the basis. Yeah. These people should not be squeezed the last cent out of a liter of milk or out of, out of their produce. Yeah. And I think that's where a basic discussion in our society and policy needs to go. How is it possible that people who produce the most fundamental thing in life, which is food, that they often don't make a serious living? That is not a proper organization of a system to start with. So we have a big task there. The agency plays a small role in it, but we want to play that role to the fullest. Yeah, I can see a bigger discussion coming up later yeah. on, so we'll yeah. schedule one. We take one quick question from uh, the floor again before I give you uh, the floor back for final remarks, but Constant, yeah. please. Time is short, so I'll squeeze, it, squeeze this in uh, from uh, Ivan Conesa. Uh, don't we need some clarification between roles, uses among what seems an increasing uh, number of data services, IONET, EMODnet, Copernicus, a clear Modnet. overall one-op shop would e 
would ease also the visibility to the citizen. And he has a quick follow-up. Restoration is indeed important and necessary. However, it will rarely bring back an ecosystem to its original state and functionalities in a few years. Since we are now putting restoration at policy level, wouldn't it be logical to also ban further destruction of still non-degraded important habitats and ecosystems? The short response is yes and yes. Yeah, of course, uh, of course. We know that irreversibilities are part of why we now say it's not five till 12 with biodiversity and climate, it's five past 12. We already see irreversibilities. We have to be really careful with tipping points that we have yeah. reached. So yes, preventing is always better, but the restoration agenda is absolutely necessary as well. Yeah, I, I have to say it's not, it's not one or the other. What we and and what we have seen there's been, again I'll just talk about specific example around peatlands is there could be really positive rehabilitation and uh, and that the biodiversity the ecosystems really do return so it's it's not one or the other it has to be both. I think it goes back to what Hans was making as a point preserving the natural capital as a whole. Yeah. Um, so with that note, I can see it's a very lively debate and we are almost actually over time by one minute. Last remarks, what do you think will be the most challenging um, objective to achieve for the decade to come? And are you personally uh, optimistic? So maybe we start with you, Laura. Um, I am optimistic. I'm a... a, a a glass half full always rather than glass half empty. I think there's loads to be optimistic about. I think the environment is absolutely center stage of the agenda now. Um, with regard to the challenge, um, I, we've talked about the challenge, a number of the challenges in the context of strategy. One challenge I would raise is post pandemic fatigue um, and people not wanting more bad news, not wanting, whether it's about the environment or anything else or or being told not to do things anymore. And I think we're going to have to make sure that the narrative that we have in the context of EEA strategy and also European strategy and national strategies is the opportunities and all of the positives that this can bring um, to society as a whole. That would, be, that would be my big challenge. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, optimism, yes. I, if if in, in what we do as our core business, you are not motivated now, now that Europe has the most ambitious agenda ever with the European Green Deal in this domain, if you're not motivated now and not energized now, yeah, when when will you be? Huh? So I think that that is clear. Uh, then the biggest challenge I think the big, biggest challenge will be uh, to be very clear about what we should stop doing in the next decade, because we know where a lot of the solutions are. We know in the energy system where the solutions are. We know uh, in, in what we should finance and investment where solutions are. We know how to come to a better mobility system. What stands in the way is what you could call the blockages. What is blocking us and how do we overcome that? And how can we move out, phase out what is not sustainable? And that is a difficult discussion because that's where opposition is. That's where maybe people lose their job, which is a serious issue. It should be taken much more seriously, the social dimension often of policies, but moving out of what is not sustainable and speeding that up to create the space for the solutions that we have that I see as the core uh, challenge for the next years. Yeah, Laura had mentioned also this kind of transition. So change is there, change is happening. It's about speeding it up and making sure that it goes in the right direction. We talked about ambition. We talked about working with partners to achieve this ambition that we have providing relevant knowledge to policymakers and making a difference. And we talked about innovation. It will be an exciting decade and with those words, I would like to thank uh, you both, Laura and Hans, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I'd like to thank all our viewers, both in Zoom and on social media for your contributions and questions. I hope it was as lively as you were expecting. And thank you to the team that has given us uh, the technical support for that. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>